Fresh water is in limited supply. It's a resource worth protecting and a prerequisite for progress, development and a healthy environment. Water knows no borders. It must be shared by all the people living along its rivers. This applies to all parts of the world and of course to Central Asia too. Surrounded by Russia, China, Afghanistan, Iran and the Caucasus, Central Asia has a unique strategic significance. The five countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, are connected to each other by a large water system on which they depend. The Tian Shan and Pamir Ranges are the main mountains of Central Asia. Rising up to 7,500 meters, their summits, covered with thick ice crusts, are among the highest on Earth. Enormous glaciers flow slowly through the high valleys. Some are several hundred meters thick. It is a hostile and dangerous zone that can be reached only with great difficulty. These glaciers contain many cubic kilometers of ice. They act as Central Asia's water storage. Up here in the mountains of the Tian Shan, you see glaciers at an altitude of about 4,000 meters. The scenery is breathtaking. Here begins our journey from the glaciers to the deltas. Join us on this journey that will take us weeks and months to explore thousands of kilometers along the great Amur Daya and Sir Daya rivers. We will seek answers to the questions that are crucial for the people in the region. How can water be used most efficiently so people can both grow crops and produce electricity. How can the donor community help the countries harness all the potential riches of the region? What is the impact of climate change on the local environment? We will talk to experts and politicians and hear their views on how to manage rivers that go through different countries, how to negotiate international agreements and how to interpret international laws. Water welds the countries in the region together into a community of destiny. Central Asia depends on water from two river basins that extend from the glaciers of the Tian Shan and Pamir ranges to the Aral Sea in the dry heart of Asia. One is the Sir Darya, it's 3,000 kilometers in length and has a catchment area of almost 300,000 square kilometers. The other is the Amu Darya. It's 2,700 kilometers long and it has a catchment area of more than 300,000 square kilometers. Together, they form the Aral Sea Basin. The Aral Sea Basin grew considerably after the huge expansion of irrigated areas along the two rivers and the construction of the Karakum Canal in Turkmenistan's desert. More and more water was used for this irrigation. This resulted in dramatic consequences. Less water arriving in the Aral Sea. Today the Aral Sea, which in 1960 was the fourth largest lake in the world, has shrunk to 10% of its original size. Its drying up is one of the greatest man-made environmental disasters. How did it come to this? Water is unevenly distributed throughout Central Asia. Mountainous countries with glaciers have enormous flows and reserves of water. In desert and steppe countries, hardly any water originates. The intensity of water use varies. Mountainous countries with little agricultural areas need less water. However, desert and steppe countries with large irrigated areas need a lot of water to grow their crops. 
So the agriculture of the downstream countries depends on the water of the upstream countries. Their cooperation is essential to their development. The situation in Central Asia and uh, water management issues uh, are, are definitely uh, uh, the top priority uh, and should be the top priority. Uh, it's recognized. It's recognized by the leadership of the countries, and you see it, uh, for example, from different uh, top-level meetings. Uh, they had a special summit uh, uh, in uh, April 2009, when the leaders of uh, five Central Asian countries discussed this. At their meeting in April 2009 in Almaty, the five presidents expressed a clear intention to carry out joint programs and to optimize the cross-border water management. The aim was to improve the environmental and socio-economic situation in order to ensure sustainable development and regional security. IFAS is a unique organization because it is organized by five presidents of five central Asian states. There's no one organization where during all this time all five presidents say whatever are the political changes, we belong to this organization. IFAS is our organization. The decisions and projects of the International Fund for Saving the Aral Sea, IFAS, aim at improving the livelihoods of people in this region. Our journey takes us from the glaciers of the Tian Shan to the Son Kul, the second largest lake in Kyrgyzstan. Here it is lonely. The horizon spreads infinitely. You feel closer to heaven than to earth. The Son Kul is one of the sources of the Sir Darya. Also in this lake, a lifeline of Central Asia begins. Here in winter, freezing temperatures are prevalent at an altitude of over 3,000 meters. But in summer, the Sonkul Lake is an important grazing area. In warm seasons, cattle breeders drive their herds from dry and overgrazed valleys up here, following the millennial rhythm of the nomads. In the past, cattle breeders used to be nomads all year round. Nowadays, they live in their homes in the valleys during the cold months and only return to their old habits during summer. Meanwhile, modernization has come to this place. The nomads welcome tourists. The nearest town is now reached in a jeep rather than on horseback. But they still remain faithful to their traditions and their way of life. They live on what nature has to offer and they take only what they need. The nomads have learnt how to be content and adaptable. Just as they did centuries ago, they still travel across the vast plains and along the rivers. They always look for the best pastures and places that have water. Our journey continues. We are traveling from the wide Sonkul Plateau down to the valley, following the water. The highlands are a herbal paradise. Chamomile, sage, lichen, monkshood and ginseng. Many of them are valued as medicinal herbs. In spring, countless flowers that vanished long ago in other areas bloom here. Kyrgyzstan is a natural paradise that is waiting to be discovered. Kyrgyzstan is about half the size of Germany. Tall mountains make up over 65% of the country, which is very sparsely populated. The people live mainly in areas with fertile soil and sufficient water to make farming possible.
Kyrgyzstan's capital, Bishkek, has nearly one million inhabitants. The former caravan station was transformed into a garrison town by the Russians in the 19th century. Its fertile black soil attracted farmers even from distant Europe. Bishkek is a vibrant modern city with wide boulevards and magnificent buildings of grand Soviet design. Numerous trees growing along the streets offer shade during the hot summer days. Kyrgyzstan has a continental climate with hot dry summers and very cold winters. But thanks to its mountains, Kyrgyzstan is rich in water. 4% of the country is covered with glaciers. Up to 80% of the water comes from the glaciers or from seasonal snowmelt. The livestock industry is an important part of Kyrgyz agriculture, which contributes 35% of the gross domestic product. Kumis, fermented mare's milk, is a traditional drink with medicinal powers. No nomad can imagine life without drinking fresh kumis. It ensures a long, healthy life. It's not everyone's cup of tea. It tastes a bit salty and bitterly pungent. However, considering its healing powers, it becomes really delicious. In the mountains above Lake Izikul, the Kumtor gold mine is located at 4,000 meters. It was developed in 1997. The gold-bearing rock is mined under extreme conditions in an open pit. Kumtor is one of the world's most productive gold mines. In addition to the huge water resources, it is the economic backbone of Kyrgyzstan. Every branch of industry needs a reliable water supply. Without water from the nearby glaciers, gold mining would be impossible. Machines crush boulders. Huge amounts of water are mixed with finely ground rock. Gold in this mud is separated from its host rock. It is a costly and energy-intensive process. About 2,000 miners work day and night in the Kumtor mine. As a result, the precious metal can be finally poured into the molds. Cyanide, a toxic and water-soluble cyanide salt, plays an important role in this process. Only the cyanide solution can separate the gold from the crushed ore. After being processed, the remaining brown mud is pumped into numerous settling ponds on the mine site. Above the mine lies Petrov Lake. Experts are concerned that the lake, once a reliable water reservoir for gold extraction, has become a threat to the mine. Within the last few years, the lake's size increased by one and a half times. The rapid melting of the glaciers due to global warming threatens the stability of the lake front. Experts fear that its protective embankment may soften and break, flooding the mine. This could cause enormous economic and ecological damage to the region. The farmers in these mountain regions have been living along the riverbanks for centuries. They live on and with water. It is the foundation of their existence. We are in Tajikistan, on our way to Dashti Obordan in the Zarafshan Valley. It is a remote, arid, mountainous region. But people have adapted to its harsh conditions and they know how to deal with the precious water. Situated high above steep banks of the Zarafshan River, 
Dashti Obordan makes its living by agriculture. Even the smallest piece of land in this stone desert has been transformed into a fertile oasis. Canals and pipelines run through the village. They bring water to every house. The sophisticated distribution system is centuries old, simple yet reliable. Today, however, water is essential not only for agriculture. Water is an important source of energy as well. We are on the road to a construction site of a hydroelectric power plant near the village. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the energy infrastructure in remote mountain regions of the country faced difficulties. It resulted in unreliable electricity supply. A solution to this problem lies in small local power plants. With the help of the German Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, GIZ, a small hydro power plant is being built in Dashti Oberdan. Construction workers built canals to direct water from a small tributary of the Zerafshan to a turbine. The work had to be done with shovels and pickaxes. Manual labor is cheaper than machine work because the cost of transporting heavy equipment here is so high. The small power plant will soon supply Dashti Oberdan with electricity. Hydro plants of this design, efficient and simple to maintain, are ideal for remote and inaccessible locations. The diverted river water is fed into a downpipe. A few meters difference in elevation is enough for the water to spin the turbine. This gives Dashti Oberdan a chance to reconnect to modern times. First of all, it is necessary for the pupils, for this our schools, for our hospitals. And our, at the hospitals, uh, we can use modern, modern. Uh, medical systems for the keeping the health of our uh, people. At schools, the pupils will learn uh, during the day uh, the, to work on computer and new technic technical uh, systems. Uh, the uh, population can use all kinds of electricity for their life, necessary for their life. We are here again, in the village school of Dashti Oberdan. The school is equipped with only bare necessities. Once the small electric plant powers the school, modern equipment like computers can be purchased for the classes. The education will be better. Perhaps some of the students will get a chance to study at a university in a city. Today, village elders and farmers have gathered in the school. Everyone should understand why electricity is so important to their village. It's not just about a better education for the children. It is also about electric power for every household, for craftsmen and for agriculture. If electricity will be available in Dashti Oburdan, Life in the village will change for the children and also for the elderly people. With hydropower, the people in the mountain region will create a better place for future generations. Our journey continues. The next stop is Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan. On a new road built by the Chinese, we have to frequently stop because of heavy traffic. Homes and villas near the capital city 
show that the difficult times that immediately followed independence are in the past for some people. Here, prosperity is not so rare anymore. Tajikistan is half the size of Italy. The Pamir and Alai mountains cover more than 90% of Tajikistan's territory. Half of the country is situated above 3,000 meters. After a civil war in the 90s, life in the country has been improving. The capital city welcomes its visitors in a friendly and cosmopolitan atmosphere. Dushanbe is the administrative, cultural and industrial center of the country. There are numerous construction sites that are visible throughout the city. Monuments and statues symbolize not only the economic growth but also celebrate the city's rich cultural heritage. Tajikistan is rich in water resources. More than 25,000 rivers flow across the country. We can see clearly from the plain the enormous potential of the country's water resources. This already became obvious in Soviet times. Not far from Dushanbe, the capital, a massive concrete wall sits across the Vaksh River embankment. It is the Nurek Dam, and from bottom to top it measures 300 meters. It is the tallest dam in the world. In the mountainous Tajikistan, electricity generation using water is a great national task. Water and hydropower are key factors for Tajikistan's way into the future. It took 20 years to build and it has stored the water of the Vaksh River since 1980. Nurek is only one component of a large national power plant grid. The Tajik government is committed to continuing the Soviet-era program of building numerous hydro plants across the country so every river can be used to its full potential. The Tajik government's most ambitious project is to build a dam at Rogun, upstream from the Nurek Dam. The Rogun Dam would produce 3,600 megawatts of energy in the future. With possibly as much as 335 meters, it would be not just the tallest dam in the world, but also the most powerful in Central Asia. Construction of the project began in 1980 under Soviet rule and stopped in the early 90s. Now the Tajik government wants to finish it. But the project has met with fierce objections from downstream countries. Moreover, it is not sure if this project is technically feasible and economically viable. World Bank experts are examining this project. Such huge investments entail significant risks, but these plans also bring great expectations. Hydropower is an important source of energy. Central Asia has enough rivers to supply the region with electricity. Furthermore, the surplus energy can be exported and become an important source of income. But today, the region's hydropower potential is far from fully exploited. However, increasing reliance of the Central Asian countries on hydroelectric power has consequences. Water power generation competes with other forms of water use. Kyrgyzstan's Toktogul Dam and Reservoir are a good example. Its volume is 19.5 cubic kilometers. In Soviet times, the downstream countries Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan could rely on the Toktogul water supply for their agriculture. In the spring and summer growing season, the dam opened up and let through sufficient amounts of water to irrigate their fields. Today, 
Kyrgyzstan must release its water in winter to power its turbines so that people can plug in electric heaters and keep warm. This competition for water resources causes tensions between the upstream and downstream countries. A solution was found in 1998 with an agreement in which the downstream countries agreed to supply coal and gas to Kyrgyzstan in winter. Kyrgyzstan agreed to release the water only in spring and summer, when it can be used for irrigation. Unfortunately, this agreement lasted only a few years. Water and energy enable people to have a better life. This requires joint efforts supported both by all countries in the region and by the international community. Central Asia and Afghanistan have energy resources that many, many other countries and regions in the world would love to have. And Central Asia and Afghanistan are exploiting those resources and making a better world for their, for their people. Participants of this meeting in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan's capital, in August 2011 discussed issues of regional use of water resources and energy trade in the future with Afghanistan's participation. We are flying to the Pamir Mountains. We are on the way to the place where the Amu Darya originates. The area is so remote that it's accessible only by helicopter. Local people call the Pamirs the roof of the world. This exotic place attracts courageous tourists and extreme climbers. The Pamir still fascinates explorers just as it fascinated Marco Polo, whose path to China in the 13th century led him through these mountains. We see a plateau at the altitude of 4,000 meters, covered with huge glaciers. The Fedchenko Glacier, currently extending for 77 kilometers, is one of the longest in the world. But even this giant is shrinking. Not only is it getting shorter, its one kilometer thick ice is getting thinner. Climate change leaves visible marks even up here in the freezing cold. In recent decades, the Fedchenko Glacier decreased by hundreds of meters. Huge tailor slopes give us a vague idea of how far the ice has advanced. The increasing glacier melt in almost all mountain regions of the world is caused by global warming. This trend becomes particularly evident in Central Asia. The glacier volume has rapidly decreased in the last few decades. We may face a continuous melting of these glaciers. As a result, the amount of water that flows from the Pamirs will decline in the very long run. Annual average temperatures in Central Asia have been rising. A rise of two degrees seems to be insignificant, yet in fact this trend is alarming. Researchers know that even small temperature changes may have a massive impact on the environment. The consequences of climate change are already evident. We can expect larger amounts of meltwater for a shorter period of time. However, this is not a positive trend. Glacial lakes are growing larger and will probably overflow. The higher water pressure destabilizes slopes, causing landslides that can bury entire villages. 
For example, the tallest natural dam in the world is situated in the Pamir. After an earthquake in 1911, a slope slid down into the valley where the Murgab River flowed, burying the village of Osoy. A massive 500-meter-tall rock wall created the Sares Lake, which today is 56 kilometers long. Most experts consider the dam condition to be safe, but given local seismic activity and glacier melt, slopes above the dam may become unstable and fall into the lake, sending water over the top. A collapse of the natural dam of the Sares Lake would be disastrous for people on the banks of rivers in Central Asia. Not far from the Sares Lake, we are flying over Horuk, the capital of Tajikistan's gorno badakhshan autonomous province. Horuk, the most important town in the Pamirs, is situated at the confluence of the Gund and Panj rivers, two tributaries of the Amu Darya. The Panj forms a natural border, hundreds of kilometers long, between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Some of the Amu Darya water originates in Afghanistan. That's why that country will play an increasingly important role in future water management plans. As Afghanistan continues to develop and uh, as Afghanistan uh, becomes more secure, uh, we uh, are foreseeing uh, to develop our agricultural base uh, and uh, also industrial base in the northern part of uh, Afghanistan. This will require water and uh, um, we will have uh, more demand for water for irrigation and also not only for irrigation but for industrial and urbanization purposes. Originating in north and northeast Afghanistan, the Kunduz the Murgab and the Tejen rivers flow into the Amu Darya and eventually into the Karakum Canal. The Panj is one of the main tributaries of the Amu Darya. Therefore, it is very important to involve Afghanistan in the future negotiations and the planning process. Our journey continues. Our destination is the junction of Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Away from the few main roads, you need a jeep to get around. The boundaries between the three countries are extremely complicated. Sometimes they follow contours of the land, while at other times they respect the ethnicity of the residents. There are several exclaves, like islands on foreign soil. How water is distributed is a tremendously delicate issue. Many rivers cross several state borders within a short distance. We are in the exclave Varuk, a fertile oasis of a few square kilometers that is sandwiched between barren dry ridges. The enclave belongs to Tajikistan but is completely located in Kyrgyz territory. The Tajiks in Varuk make their living from farming and from the water that flows down from the peaks of Kyrgyzstan's mountains. Water connects the Kyrgyz and Tajik people. They depend on each other. The way one acts affects the other. A complex system of canals and weirs distributes water. It's not just about the needs of agriculture. The water distribution here has always had a political dimension. Since Soviet times, water rates have regulated the amount of water that was received. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan should remain in dialogue with each other at the local level. Trust must prevail in order to guarantee everyone's access to water resources whenever they need them.
Hundreds of kilometers away from its glacial sources, water leaves the mountains and flows slowly towards the Fergana Valley. Where there is no water, Central Asia's landscape is defined by the desert climate. Numerous canals bring water to the plains and distribute it throughout the places where people want to reclaim steppe land for agricultural use in the future, and where farming has been practiced for centuries. With the help of the German Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, GIZ, a new high-accuracy water level measurement system is used here, on the edge of the Fergana Valley near the Kyrgyz town of Batken. Modern tools collect precise data. Fixed probes along the canals measure the water level and transmit the data. Accurate and precise measurements are an important step in improving water management in Central Asia. Consequences of these measures have political significance. Because there are no sufficient data that can be presented in a transparent and credible way, we use exactly this amount of water and no more. These records must be available. To obtain these data, we must create water level measurement posts hydro posts, to make these measurements transparent, so that interested partners on the other side of the border can check the actual water consumption at any time. Step by step, hydro posts must be installed at all canals. A network of monitoring stations with cutting-edge technology will hopefully extend sooner or later throughout Central Asia. All data will be analyzed in an office of the Programme for Transboundary Water Management in Central Asia. The German government wants to support the transboundary cooperation in Central Asia by its Berlin Process Initiative. For this reason, the German Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit and the government of Kyrgyzstan jointly run this office. As long as we are talking about water resources that cross international boundaries, no single state is an owner of these water resources. Our, a typical transboundary water resource situation uh, must be viewed from the perspective of established principles and rules of international law that govern transboundary water courses or transboundary aquifers. And current international law rejects the idea of either absolute sovereignty or absolute ter territorial integrity. Once it arrives on the territory of a state, water cannot be used at discretion. Local organizations ensure a responsible and fair distribution of water. The new digital measurement system supports the work of water user associations, like this one here in Kyrgyzstan. Local water users associations in the Fergana Valley and throughout Central Asia are crucial because they regulate local distribution of water. They are democratically organized. All farmers who are members of the association have a say. They make efforts to find solutions to disputes, keep in touch with authorities and politicians, collect fees and take care of the maintenance of the canals. The work of the water users' associations ensures that water reaches the fields. We are taking a walk together with a farmer on his sunflower field. After consulting his user association, he takes only as much water for his plants as they require. He pays a small fee for this. He does not pay directly for the water, rather for the water supply service provided by the Water Users Association. However, the fees depend on the type of plants. How much do you pay for the water? It depends on the crop. If we cultivate sunflower, for example, we pay 450 to 500 som.
the same for corn. But if we have a different crop such as potatoes and onions, then we pay 1500 to 1800 som. For centuries, the vast Fergana Valley, surrounded by tall mountains, has been used for agriculture. An important component of the extensive irrigation system in the Fergana Valley is the Great Fergana Canal. More than 160,000 Uzbek and Tajik farmers were conscripted by the Communist Party to build the canal in 1939. No construction machines were available, so the 270 kilometer long canal was built with simple tools and bare hands in only 45 days. It was really a pharaonic project. According to the Soviet ideology, humans had to conquer and tame nature at any cost. The Fergana Canal played a crucial role in agricultural development of the region. The valley is the breadbasket of Central Asia. Three nations share the Fergana Valley. Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. With a population of more than 10 million people, it is the most densely populated region in Central Asia. The irrigated farmlands are located mainly in Uzbekistan. Therefore, Uzbekistan depends on water from the mountainous countries Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. This has always caused tensions. That's why cross-border cooperation based on agreements is very important. The Kairakum Reservoir is situated on the west side of the Fergana Valley, also known as the Tajik Sea. Since 1956 it has been damming the Sir Darya near the town of Khojand. Floating pump stations take millions of litres of water from the reservoir. This is an expensive method that consumes a large amount of electricity. The pumps supply up to 40% of the irrigated land in the region with water. In the future, more efficient irrigation methods must be introduced. A simple system of small canals and embankments delivers water to the fields in precise amounts. Rice cultivation needs large amounts of water, especially here where precipitation is low. The farmers in the fields of the Fergana Valley work hard. Agricultural machines are rarely used here. Even though the local agriculture still has a very traditional character, the valley is a lush breadbasket. Even in the times of the legendary Silk Road, it fed locals and travelers, offered them safe shelter and a resting place. No piece of land remains unused. Rice, cereals, fruits, vegetables and grapes feed millions of people. Cotton, the white gold of Central Asia, also grows here. Soon the small plants will yield a rich harvest that is in great demand worldwide. The canals distribute water not only to the fields, but also to the villages. Irrigated agriculture in the Fergana Valley ensures modest prosperity for many people. Meanwhile, the farmers had to learn to deal with water not only economically, but also carefully. Pollution from agriculture, industry and mining affects water quality of the Sir Darya. Therefore, farmers make a distinction between industrial water coming directly from the rivers and drinking water from the aquifers. Gubernator, Gubernator, Mayor. Now, Lord, you're a pure, you're a pure. 
On the huge Panchambe Bazaar in Kojand, farmers sell their goods. The bazaar boasts a wide range of products produced by farmers in the Fergana Valley. There is also fish from the Sia Daria and the nearby Karakum Reservoir. Every day, women bring fresh or smoked fish to the bazaar. Ensuring food security for the growing population today and in the future is a challenge. For Central Asia is young. Millions of young people will be shaping the future of their countries. High population growth rates in many Central Asian countries increase the pressure on farmland. A consequence of this is a steady increase in water use in recent decades. In the 60s, about 25 million people lived in the five countries of Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. And today there are approximately 60 million people here. This means that with a doubling of the population, more agricultural land is needed. This affects how much water has been taken, approximately up to 90% from the two large Amudarya and Sirdarya rivers. 90% of this water is used for irrigation. And this water is used, of course, for plants, then consumed by people and is missing in the large water circle. We are leaving the Fergana Valley. Our journey takes us through large irrigated areas, past cotton fields that will soon be harvested. We are crossing the Sir Daria River that is still strong and full flowing here in its middle reaches. Our destination is Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan. The Amu Darya and Sir Darya flow through Uzbekistan, but barely 10% of the required water actually originates in Uzbek territory. Unlike Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, Uzbekistan consists of up to 80% of arid land. The Kizil Kum and Karakum, located in western and central Uzbekistan, are among the largest deserts in the world. This is Tashkent. The television tower is the pride and the symbol of the city. It combines contemporary style with traditional Uzbek elements. It is a symbol of a nation that tries to preserve its rich heritage and at the same time turns its gaze to the future. Tashkent is over 2,000 years old, but it was completely destroyed in 1966 during an earthquake. Some monuments were forever lost in this catastrophe. At the same time, planners got an opportunity to implement their vision of a new city, a symbol of Soviet modernization in Asia. Today, Tashkent is a cosmopolitan city. Bazaars, broad boulevards, spacious parks and numerous fountains illuminate the cityscape. Since 1991, Tashkent has radically changed both economically and culturally. Tashkent builds for the future. For example, the National Bank of Uzbekistan skyscraper, the Intercontinental Hotel, the International Business Center, and the Plaza Building. In Tashkent, we are visiting the office of the Water Basin Organization, the BVO, that manages the Sir Darya water resources in Uzbekistan. Our task is to supply stable water. Also here, a data collection system has been implemented in recent years. It should improve the distribution and the use of water. Uh, there are many uh, kinds of data about levels, discharge, 
volumes of uh, reservoirs. Uh, we have own data, about 400 points. We control 400 points on, on the river about uh, water discharge and water level. This data about water level, water volume, uh, water release and water income uh, comes to us for operators of hydropower generation stations. But collecting data is only one step towards more effective water use. Another big challenge is the renovation and the expansion of the existing infrastructure. Canals stretch for thousands of kilometers throughout the desert. Large amounts of water evaporate under the blazing sun. Every litre of water is highly appreciated. Many canals were built several decades ago. Poor construction quality and inadequate maintenance cause water loss. Even the canals that were once at the cutting edge of modern technology are now in poor condition. A lot of money must be invested into the complex canal system in order to restore its proper efficiency. For this reason, the Central Asian governments work closely with their international partners. An example of such cooperation can be found at the Zerafshan River near Samarkand. Here, the Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, GIZ, works with the Uzbek government to modernize the canal. We sealed all canal. In the rehabilitated part, there was the silting of the canal. They have taken all weeds out and tree, uh, trees out and improved the, uh, the, the, the speed of the canal. Here, when you have reconstructed canal, you reduce the losses up to 40%. The water user associations here are organized like those in Kyrgyzstan. In Uzbekistan, of course, farmers don't, don't pay for water as it is, but they pay for costs to deliver water to their uh, irrigation sites or, or, or plots. So they cover the costs of water user associations for delivering water to their fields. The appreciation of the value of water and the understanding of the need for responsible water use are not new ideas. These ideas have century-deep roots in the culture of Central Asia. Since time immemorial, people have settled where water runs. Along the once vibrant Silk Road connecting Europe and China, we find the big old cities of Central Asia, Bukhara, Khiva and Samarkand. Once they offered shelter to those who came from and went into the desert. Because the cities were rich in water, they were cultural and commercial centers for centuries. Centers of Islam. In Islam, water is the source of all life. Allah is compared to an infinite ocean. Water is viewed as a precious gift from Allah. Also, cool, clear water runs in paradise. Therefore, water must be shared and must be available to everyone. Water is the source of civilization. We are on our way from Samarkand to Ashgabat, the capital of neighboring Turkmenistan, which is the driest country in the region. Below us is the Amu Darya. It is like a narrow strip of life across the vast desert that spreads for hundreds of kilometers. Over 80% of Turkmenistan is covered by the huge Karakum Desert. Due to the hot climate, it has never been easy to live in this inhospitable part of Central Asia. Turkmenistan has very little fertile soil and almost no sources of water. 
life here is only possible thanks to a costly irrigation system. The country's most important source of water, the Amu Darya, flowing on the eastern border with Uzbekistan, is located far from population centers in the south. The Karakum Canal made it possible for cities to grow and opened up new tracts of land for agriculture. The 1,400 kilometer long canal branches off from the Amu Darya. It runs across the Karakum Desert, almost reaching the Caspian Sea. The construction of this gigantic canal began in 1954. It is one of the longest canals in the world. The construction project in the desert was part of man's conquest of nature, as proclaimed by Stalin in the Soviet Union. Along the canal in this once lifeless area, agriculture was now possible. Mass production of cotton was promoted. The canal derives a huge amount of water from the Amu Darya. Central Asia's Great River loses up to half its water to the Karakum Canal. Some just drains away in the sandy bottom of the canal. But the expression that desert blooms is more than a metaphor in Turkmenistan. The capital city, Ashgabat, is expanding. It keeps on wresting new land from the desert for construction projects. Marble-clad, high-rise buildings soar into the ever-blue sky. And yet, Ashgabat seems to have no shortage of water. Fountains, canals, parks and splendid boulevards dominate the city. Turkmenistan is proud of its cultural achievements. It is the water of the Karakum Canal that makes it possible for people to survive here in one of the driest places in Asia and to live between tradition and modernization. Water is scarce, and because of this, it has an economic value. Oasis inhabitants, such as the people in the region of Merv, east of Turkmenistan, know that. Everyone here is aware of different stakes that the users of the available water resources have, and these interests are centuries old. People have always tried to find a balance between interests of water usage, agriculture and energy generation, drinking water supply, industry and environment. Based on this, the concept of Integrated Water Resources Management, IWRM, was developed in the 90s. The aim of this internationally accepted concept is to use water by taking into account the needs of all consumers. It should maximize economic and social benefits and ensure the existence of a sustainable ecosystem. Water resources management should be based on an approach that includes the right to participate in decision-making processes. Consumers, as well as planners and politicians, should be involved at all levels. Converting the desert into productive agricultural land is a big challenge. Throughout Central Asia, the problems are obvious. Improper irrigation methods cause soil salinization as the salt in the earth is brought to the surface by the water. Once arable land becomes infertile again. Fresh water washes salts, pesticides and insecticides out of agricultural land. But after that, the contaminated water cannot be used anymore. In fact, it pollutes rivers and lakes. Hundreds of kilometers of canals carry this salty water to reservoirs in the desert. By using simple yet very effective methods, people try to stop the desert from growing any further. Drip irrigation provides an economical and efficient use of water. Durable local tree species such as the Haloxylon are systematically planted to stabilize the soil. Our journey continues. We are going right into the middle of the desert. 
It's almost an endless journey across the vastness of the Karakum Desert. But suddenly, in the middle of nowhere, the soil begins to glow. A fire abyss is opening. This is the Davaza gas crater. The crater has been burning for over 40 years. Natural gas comes from inside the earth and keeps the huge flames blazing constantly. Turkmenistan's gas reserves are among the largest in the world. Oil and gas will secure the country's future for many generations. From the crater, our next destination is the city of Urgenj in the Uzbek province of Horezem. The University of Urgenj and its international partners research sustainable agriculture. Dr. Jorn Lamas, agronomist for the German Center for Development Studies, oversees here the ongoing projects. The aim of the project is to make water usage more efficient for agriculture and to regenerate lost agricultural land. University staff are mapping the huge network of canals that covers the Horezem region. Horezem is surrounded by desert. Each field, canal and pipe takes its water from the only source, the Amu Darya. So this is a graphical representation of the irrigation and drainage channels as you can find them at present in the Horizon region and which we have created together with our GIS lab and people from the national authorities. And it shows this very high density of channels in the Horizon region. Uh, just for getting some numbers, uh, in total uh, there are about 13,000 kilometers of uh, channels in total length uh, for an area of 270,000 uh, hectares and again about 8,000, 7 to 8,000 kilometers of uh, drainage channels. Not far from Ur Genj, environment friendly and water saving cultivation methods are being tested. One element of this is land leveling. Using laser measurements and field graders, fields are leveled with a precision of a few centimeters. Whether the fields are flat or uneven makes a big difference for plants that need plenty of water. In order to be completely covered by water, uneven fields require larger amounts of water. Aligned fields, however, can be watered sparingly. Another important element is the concept of preserving farming methods. And we are standing here in front of an experiment of seven hectares, so operational site experiment, where we have, or where we test. On the left hand, you can see conventional, how farmers at present in Uzbekistan cultivate cotton. And on this part of the field, you can see uh, conservation agricultural practices. The preserving farming methods are based on three principles. The soil should be treated in a gentle way. For this reason, the use of machines is minimized. With the green manuring method, plant residues remain in the fields. That enriches the soil with nutrients and saves labor. Finally, it is very important to focus more on crop rotation rather than on monoculture crops. Which allows us not only to demonstrate farmers, look, this is the difference, what you can see, mm -hmm. but of course we can also afterwards calculate from how much yield you get more and what actually, what treatment, what combination yeah. of activities brings the most. Inefficient and unsustainable farming practices destroy the soil and turn the field into barren ground. Fallow lands are becoming more of a problem, especially here in the desert where every square meter counts. With Professor Asia Kamzina from the University of Urgenj, we are visiting fallow fields that must be regenerated. Additionally, plants with specific properties are planted here. 
uh, they ranged in the um, sequ sequentially, so first we have unproductive uh, crop land, then we increase the productivity of this land by planting trees which are more appropriate plants for these types of land, which are saline, which are nutrient depleted and which are more prone to water scarcity. Why we do that? First of all for the ecological reasons, to improve the, uh, the fertility of these lands and also for productive purposes. To, to meet the ever-increasing demand of, for fiber, energy, uh, wood, mm. timber. While it is regenerating, the soil can already be profitably used. This is an important incentive for farmers to support this project. Also, by mixing different tree species, you are able to diversify the risks. Because uh, if uh, one of the species is attacked by the pest, you still can have benefits uh, from the other tree species. Here, productive land will soon be available to the farmers. Instead of undergoing an expensive process of reclaiming agricultural land from the desert, already existing fields can be reused. In order to use available water resources more efficiently, large investments were made in the infrastructure. Thanks to modern construction methods, new canals and weirs regulate the distribution of water and reduce water loss. This is especially important in Horzem, for the intensive agriculture of the region requires a lot of water. Shortly before sunset, we are approaching the Badai Tugai Nature Park. The diverse fauna and flora of regions along the Amudaria and Sirdaria have been destroyed by agricultural land. Today, original floodplains can be found in few places. One of these places are the Tugai Woods here on the banks of the Amudaria. The Tugai Woods have one of the highest biodiversity in Central Asia. Here, there are pheasants, Bactrian deer and jungle cats. It is a natural oasis in the middle of the desert. The government has declared the remaining Tugai Woods a nature reserve. From here, the Amu Darya flows towards the Aral Sea. On its way there, the trail of the powerful river gets lost in its vast delta and among huge irrigated areas. The amount of water decreases as it reaches the Aral Sea, what once used to be the fourth largest inland sea in the world with an area of 68,000 square kilometers has been decreasing for decades. Since 1960, the sea's surface area has shrunk by approximately 80% and its volume by 90%. The Aral Sea split into numerous little lakes. Today, Former port cities lie many kilometers away from the water. Like Moynak. This local sign remains witness to the past wealth and confidence of the town. Moynak used to be Uzbekistan's only port town. Today the shore of the Aral Sea lies more than 150 kilometers away from here. The sun is blazing down on dusty streets and houses. Not many people can find jobs here. Time seems to stand still in Moynak. The local museum preserves memories of cargo ships and a fishing fleet departing Moynak and going to sea. A reminiscence of good bygone times. In the past, the fish factory delivered over 22 million cans to all regions of the Soviet Union annually. Over 30,000 people earned their living by the fishing industry in the Aral Sea region. Fishermen worked day and night. Large ships with refrigeration facilities made sure that the catch remained fresh during the long trip across the huge lake. It was top quality fish. It was in abundance, so the catch was often twice as heavy as it was expected to be. Mm. 
Thanks to its rich flora and fauna, tourists enjoyed this place as a nature paradise. There were beaches along the seashore, and vacationers came here from all parts of the Soviet Union. Today, one cannot watch the waves of the Aral Sea from the old pier of the former port anymore. Here, the Aral Sea is a dead land, desert and steppe. On the dry bed of the former lake lie the rusting hulls of fishing boats and freighters. Most plants and animals have disappeared. The unique ecosystem that once attracted tourists to the Aral Sea is destroyed. The fish industry no longer exists. Many people's livelihoods were destroyed. Thousands lost hope and work. We meet Boltabek Trutanbayev. He used to work at the fish factory in Moynak and recalls the old days. In the past, when we still had fish, there were five fish factories here. Canned fish was produced here. Our canned fish was sold abroad. Even Germany, Romania, Czechoslovakia and Bulgaria bought our products because our fish tasted very good. Yes, there was ship transport. We had passenger ships. A ship trip to Aralsk took exactly 24 hours. I had my family there. Relatives of my father, my mother, my uncle lived there. I often spent my holidays there visiting wedding parties. There we also went by plane, but in case of bad weather, we took a passenger ship. In the evening we took a boat, and the next night we arrived in Aralsk. We had a good beach. One kilometer from here there was a very good beach with soft sand, better than anywhere else. I was in Yalta. Yalta has lots of stones. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, we have soft, hot sand here. People came here to relax. <laughs> We are traveling to the former bottom of the Aral Sea which turned into a new desert, the Aral Kum. With the shrinking of the lake, an important factor in climate regulation in Central Asia disappears too. Without the sea, the climate here is getting hotter and drier. However, some people have recently returned to this place. In some parts of the dry lake bed, exploration for oil and natural gas has begun with success. Mainly economic considerations will shape the future of the Aral Sea. To reach the northern side of the former lake, we have to cross the border to Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is the largest country in Central Asia. Two-thirds of its territory consists of deserts, semi-deserts and steppes. It is rich in mineral resources such as oil, gas and precious metals. Large sums of money are allocated to modernizing this vast country. In 1997, Astana was established as the new capital of Kazakhstan, a symbol of an ambitious country on the rise. Almost all its large buildings were built after Astana became the capital. Nearly one million people live in this futuristic city. 
Astana is sometimes called the Dubai of the steppe. World famous architects like Sir Norman Foster and Kisho Kurokawa got a chance to build here. Skyscrapers and magnificent buildings demonstrate the progress of Kazakhstan, this connecting point between Asia's new powers. For all parts of the large country, Astana wants to be a shining example of future opportunities. Not all regions of Kazakhstan have yet benefited in the same way from new opportunities. The town of Aralsk is situated in the north of the former Aral Sea. Besides the Uzbek Moynak, Aralsk also used to be an important port with a fishing fleet and fish factories. Here, likewise, industry and jobs disappeared along with the lake. Many people left the town. Its problems are obvious. Besides all the consequences of the Aral Sea tragedy, there are some signs of slow recovery. Aralsk is changing. Recently, a lot of money has been invested in new playgrounds, kindergartens and schools. There are also investments in education. Children are the future. The new generation is also fully aware of the importance of water resources. Students and teachers have gathered at the local school. The International Fund for Saving the Aral Sea organized a drawing contest. Children should depict their visions of the past and the present life at the Aral Sea and their future. The artworks convey a message of value of each drop of water. They picture hope for the return of the sea. The students take this assignment seriously. They believe in a better future. They can help revive the Aral Sea as paradise as it once used to be. National and international partners should view the confidence and hope of the new generation as commitment to work together to solve the water problem. Necessary institutions already exist. In April 2009, the Executive Committee of the International Fund for Saving the Aral Sea, IFAS, was assigned by the President of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan to develop a new Aral Sea program and to prepare proposals for IFAS reform with international support. International experts and representatives of IFAS member countries work on this assignment. We have all together 45 project proposals in our program. It was not an easy task to work out RLC Basin Program 3. We had to take into account the challenges which come from the climate change, from population growth, from an infrastructure which needs urgently rehabilitation and many more. The Aral Sea Program 3 focuses on integrated water resources management, environmental protection, socio-economic development, improving the legal framework and administrative structures of the organization. The cooperation with the international donor community has great significance. Representatives of the United Nations, USAID, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation and the German Gesellschaft für internationale Zusammenarbeit regularly have consultations to support regional cooperation. All donors recognize that the management of the, of the water and energy resources in the region, which are intertwined, have the, if they are managed in a more effective way, they have the 
potential to unlock huge uh, opportunities for development and economic growth in the region. Everybody understands this. Regional cooperation in, in the field of water is uh, pretty much an unfinished uh, business. Um, uh, there is still a lot of uh, wastage of water. Water could be used uh, much more efficiently. So uh, this is the ambition of the, uh, the different projects uh, which we are supporting to implement um, integrated water resources management uh, principles. In December 2010, the RLC Programme 3 was presented by EC IFAS to government representatives, NGOs, national and international organisations. It is the final part of our journey. We are flying to the North Aral Sea in Kazakhstan. The Kokaral Dam is below us. Since 2005, the 13 kilometer long dam has collected water in the Northern Aral Sea. This important project was funded by the World Bank. This proves that right steps are taken to save the northern part of the Aral Sea. For example, in 2010, so much water flowed down the Sir Daria River into the northern part of the Aral Sea that large quantities of it had to be released into the southern part. From the fishing village of Tastubek, fishermen go out to the sea once again. With the recovery of nature, people return to the lifestyles they had lost many years ago. The earlier critical water salinity decreased, water became much clearer and fish stocks grow each year. Fishermen in boats returned with their rich catch. Carp, pike, flounder, pike perch and nearly two dozen other species are again at home in the sea. Meanwhile, the small Aral Sea now covers a surface of 3,000 square kilometers. The government of Kazakhstan plans to raise the existing dam or build another one. Possibly one day, water will return to the old port town of Aralsk. Finally, we reached the Aral Sea. This is the end of our journey from the glaciers to the deltas. We traveled thousands of kilometers by car and by plane. We attended conferences and seminars in all Central Asian countries. We had many people with whom we could discuss the issues of the use of water. And it all became clear. The water of the Amordaya in Sirdaya is scarce. The best possible use has to be made of it. How is this possible? Regional cooperation is the key. We have found answers to our questions. One thing is certain. The climate change in Central Asia will not stop. Glaciers are retreating. Countries need to develop strategies for adaptation and mitigation of climate changes. Actions of one country have an impact on other countries along the river. Most of the experts say that the region has enough water, but it is unevenly distributed. Water should be used more effectively and efficiently, and principles of integrated water resources management should be implemented. At the regional level, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan should work together to develop a clear vision in order to solve the problems in the region. The Aral Sea Programme 3 is a step in this direction. The big intertwined water and energy problems can be solved only by joint efforts. We need agreements based on international experience which are respected. Countries should build mutual trust. Reliability is the goal. Existing UN conventions could be used as a basis for cross-border water management. The Berlin process can also make its contribution. The international donor community stands ready to support regional cooperation. In the end, 
it is all about a peaceful and better future that we can share.